Welcome to Excerpts from the Open Forum. On this program, we'll hear Mr. Harold Camping answering pre-recorded questions regarding issues from the Bible. Here's our first question. I have two questions. I have been reading the Concordance and the Interlinear Bible in Greek, and I found something in the Concordance, and I wanted to know if it's true or not. I found five verses, six verses in the old uh, part of the Bible in the, in the old that said um, when it spoke of someone having authority being a Lord it used the word Jehovah for example in the book of Judges 4 verse 18 it, it uses the word Jehovah right yeah well now uh, actually in the Hebrew language which is the major language of the Old Testament there's a little bit in Arame Aramaic but most of it is in the Hebrew uh, the uh, word Jehovah or as it's sometimes pronounced Yahweh is found thousands of times ordinarily in our King James Bible it is written w uh, Lord with all fell four letters of Lord capitalized uh, capital L capital O capital R capital D to distinguish it from the word Lord when it really means the word Lord rather than Jehovah. Now occasionally, like you found a half a dozen places, where they did translate it Jehovah, and I don't know why the translators selected those half a dozen places uh, over abo and above all the other thousands of places, but actually it's exactly the same word, Jehovah. And so then what it means is that in the original text, when in those in those six verses I found, and it's written Jehovah. Does that mean that God is really trying to tell you that Jehovah is really just a title? It's not really God's name. Oh no, it is. It is. Uh, we, we when we talk about names of God, remember uh, you and I have names. We uh, to distinguish us from all of the other people in the world. We might have two names my name is Harold Camping I have a middle name uh, uh, to help distinguish from the rest of the people of the world and uh, some people even have four names in order to distinguish from the rest of the people of the world but God has no peer he has no uh, competition of any kind he is God and he d he displays himself under a host of names the most common name is Jehovah. He also speaks of him himself as Jesus, as Christ, as uh, faithful. He takes on the name true. He takes on the name the Word of God. He takes on uh, just a whole lot of names. He calls himself David. Uh, he calls himself Cyrus. He calls himself by a whole lot of names. And none of these can we say that God, this is the name of God. They are all uh, names that God uses in order to describe something about himself. When we see the word Jesus, it means Savior. When we see the word Jehovah, it means, again, Savior. I, I am Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. When we see the no name Christ, it means the, uh, he is the anointed one. When we see the name faithful, we know that it is emphasizing God's perfect faithfulness, and so on, and so on. Mr. Campin, I'm still uh, a bit lost. If you're telling me that that is his name or that's a title, how come in the original text they used the word Jehovah when it's speaking about someone being the authoritative? someone who has authority and I only found it six times in the Bible but that six times uh, is not uh, 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 actually there's thousands of times plus these six these six are not uh, uh, why the translators only use Jehovah six times I don't know but uh, but uh, in actuality the name Jehovah and it is a name that God takes upon himself, uh, but it is not for the same purpose that we have a name. 
God, for example, talks about baptizing people into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Father is not a name. The Son is not a name. That is describing an aspect of God as he reveals himself. But on the other hand, when he uses the name Jesus uh, or uses the name Jehovah, that's not a title. That is a name God assigns to himself for the purpose of the demonstrating a characteristic of God's work, namely, in the case of Jehovah or Jesus, that he is the Savior. If you wanted to really simplify this, you could say, in the New Testament, God spoke of himself as Jesus very frequently, and in the Old Testament, he spoke of himself as Jehovah very frequently. It's one and the same God. It is uh, both names are signifying the same thing. Other question is um, um, in John chapter 8, verse 24 and verses 28. John chapter 8, verse 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Now you see the evidence of salvation is that we believe that Christ is God. Incidentally, notice this. If ye believe not that I am, uh, the word he that you find in your King James Bible is italicized to indicate it was not in the original. But the statement, I am, is another name that God assigns to himself. Remember back in Exodus when uh, Moses is asking God, well, whom shall I tell the uh, Israelites has sent me to be, uh, to be the one to lead Israel out of Egypt? God said, tell them, I am have sent you. I am that I am. I am is the name God takes upon himself to illustrate the fact that he is the ever-present one. Therefore, this verse is saying, if you do not believe, that Christ is the great I am, the great, the ever-present one, the God of the whole Bible, then you are still not saved. Now, a friend of mine is telling me, she said that the Lord forgave uh, the Jews, the Jewish people for killing Jesus, she says in the Bible. Now, is that true? Now, I don't know where to find it, but I'm asking you. Well, Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, there are theologians who read that, and they conclude that, uh, that he is forgiving the Pharisees and forgiving the high priest and forgiving the Roman soldiers and so on. Anybody, and Pontius Pilate and Judas and anyone that had anything to do with the fact that he is brought to trial, and, is, uh, and has been crucified. But that solution will not agree with the rest of the Bible. We don't read anywhere in the Bible that Christ, because in order to forgive anybody, their sins had to be paid for. And Christ did not go, not go to the cross to pay for just some of the sins of someone and not all of the sins. Fact is, if he didn't, if he had only paid for the sins of some of them, they would still, that is, some of their sins, but not all of them, they would still have to pay for all the rest of their sins, so that would make no sense at all. But the fact is, the ones that he forgave are those who caused him to be crucified, and that's me and you or anyone else who has truly become a believer. We are the ones that receive forgiveness, and the basis of that forgiveness is not just a nice statement of God, because Christ never ceased to be God, even while he was hanging on the cross, but it's on the basis that their sin, our sins have been paid for. And therefore, therefore God can forgive our sins, and we, 
we of course uh, having our sins forgiven we don't know what we what was all required we, we, when it says they know not what they do we had no idea when we became saved that, that of how and how terrible terrible the wrath of God was that had to fall on the Lord Jesus but on the basis of the fact that Christ paid for our sins therefore he can forgive us but insofar as the Jewish leaders or uh, those or Pontius Pilate or Judas no unless they became saved their sins not one of those sins uh, that uh, was involved or that uh, uh, took place in order for them to bring Christ to the cross uh, has been forgiven. They, that'll be a sin they have to pay for along with all of the multitude of every sin they've ever committed. Let me ask you something else. Is there any Bible uh, verse that refers to every, they may not be forgiven for doing that? She told me, oh, there is a Bible verse that says he did forgive him. It's in Ezekiel, she was telling me. Oh. He didn't have an Ezekiel. Well, but you see, sin is sin, whether it's committed in connection with the, with the uh, uh, crucifixion of Christ or whether it's uh, anywhere. And the wages of sin is death. That is a constant. That doesn't change. The, uh, when Judas, for example, or, uh, disobey or uh, betray Jesus, that was sin. And since he was not saved, it was, he was not forgiven. And that is true of everyone, uh, whether they, whether it was a sin involved in the crucifixion of Christ or whether it's uh, any kind of a sin that we commit, there is no forgiveness un unless Christ paid for that sin. And, and when Christ paid for sins, he did not pay for just a few of the sins of people, but he had to pay for every, every single sin of the individuals he came to save because if he had if there was one sin however tiny that he had not paid for for that individual that per person would still have to endure the wrath of God because that sin has to be paid for and so uh, uh, it, it, the those who who say this that Christ paid for the sins or that he forgave the sins of the Jews that uh, brought him to the cross are saying that simply because they do not understand what is in what what salvation really is what really is required for salvation yes oh yes i understand well i was let me say i was thinking about one more thing i wanted to ask you um what she said was oh yeah she said on the basis that jesus was in the jewish family and they were God's chosen people. That's why he forgave them. Well, but you but see... But it's still sin again, right? Yeah, you see, now, we, we, it is true mm -hmm. that the nation of Israel were mm -hmm. chosen by God That's to right. represent, to be an external representation of the kingdom of God. That's that right. did not mean that he chose each and every one of them to salvation. Oh. Most of them remained unsaved at any oh, time okay. in their history. So there, some of them weren't among the elect? There were a few that he did save, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus and, and most of the disciples and, and right. Nicodemus. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there were a few that, uh, that did become saved, but the vast majority of them, even though... They were citizens of the nation of Israel, and that was a chosen nation. Right. Nevertheless, they still are were under the wrath of God. Of oh, God. And so today, for example, or uh, now that we're at the end of the church age, the local congregations they they are also an external representation of the kingdom of God. But that doesn't mean everyone in the church is saved. No, it doesn't. All right. So only those who are true believers whom God has saved uh, have their sins paid for. And the rest, even though they yes. are externally or externally, they have been a part of the uh, kingdom of God. Uh, that doesn't mean that they were saved. You are listening to excerpts from the Open Forum on Family Radio. Mr. Harold Camping is answering pre-recorded questions about the Bible. 
If you'd like to hear more of Mr. Camping's teaching, you can hear and even download open forum broadcasts, Bible studies, and more. Just go to FamilyRadio.com and click on Audio Archives. Let's continue now with another question. Uh, Brother Campy, I'd like to thank you for your show. It's really given me a lot of insight on on what the Lord has uh, want us to do. And I have a question: Is um, in what manner should we confess our sins to the Lord God? I mean, I know He knows everything, but are we should uh, should we confess them out loud to Him, to or to one of our brothers, or or in what manner should we do this? Well, actually. You know, the wonderful thing about our relationship with God is is that God knows everything about us, and he knows it way better than we know it. And and, uh, secondly, uh, with impunity, we can tell God about everything on our hearts. When we, for example, are going to seek advice from a friend or counsel from a about some matter we sometimes are very cautious because we worry that maybe they'll abuse the the information and and disclose it to someone else or maybe we think that they're not capable of understanding or so it's it's uh, sometimes we feel that's kind of a hazardous business but when we go to the lord we can pour out our hearts and we don't have to try to come to god with fancy language or with a carefully worked out uh, plan of any kind, we just pour it out. And sometimes we may be so grief-stricken or so sin-ridden or whatever that all we can do is meekly and uh, uh, lisp, uh, uh, say, Oh, God, help me. I'm in trouble. Help me, help me, help me. God knows all of our trouble. And so we... We come boldly to the throne of grace as we read in in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 uh, because Christ is our great high priest and uh, we don't have to hold back anything. We just pour it out. And if we think we aren't doing a good uh, really expressing our feelings, we can tell the Lord, Oh, Lord, you know I can't express uh, the uh, the pathos or the anguish or the concern of my heart at all. I'm not good at words, but, oh, Lord, I'm so thankful that you know, you know all about me, and, oh, Lord, have mercy. Next question is, um, <clears throat> why is it so hard for man to do the work of the Lord, what he asks and what he commands us to do? Why is it so difficult? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, until we become saved, it is impossible. You try real hard to live like a Christian, do like a Christian, and it's uphill because uh, the more you are faithful to the Word of God, the more it is antithetical, it is a, in opposition to what your own personality wishes. You remember, before we are saved, we're a slave of sin. We're a slave of Satan. We're happiest and most uh, uh, at ease when we are doing uh, uh, that which is contrary to the will of God, when we are the number one, when we are the focus of of everything and so on. And uh, and so before we're saved, uh, it's just total uphill work. Now, when we become saved, then something wonderful has happened. It means that God has given us a brand new resurrected soul, which is an integral part of our personality now. And in our new soul, we have a want to to always do the will of God. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God, and that is, yeah, that is applicable to our new soul that from in which we have been born again from God, uh, we uh, do, can, cannot sin. We, uh, it's alien now to our new soul. We still have a body that still lusts after sin, so it's easy for us to fall into sin if we take our eyes off Christ. But on the other hand, when as we read the Bible, we have a delight in it, and, 
and that we are, are eager to try to do God's will more and more, and we find that we can get victory over this sin and that sin to a much higher degree than we ever thought of before. But Thank you very much. So, in other words, the test of the whole matter is, have I become a child of God? And if we find that real desire, and yet it just feels like uphill work all the time, I'm always fussing with sin, well, the likelihood is I'm not a child of God. And if I just think that is the case, I can keep praying, oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. It doesn't mean that I can get myself saved by praying for mercy, but I can certainly know that I can get my desire before God, and I can certainly uh, 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 ask God's help, and, and if, if I am one of the elect of God, and he's not a respecter of persons, I could just as well be one of the elect as anybody else. Uh, I, I'm just going to keep waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, and, and reading the Bible, so I'm in an environment where... If God is going to save me, he will save me very readily. Let me just make another comment here. You know, we never, never go wrong trying to do the will of God. We never go wrong spending time in the Word of God and, and uh, carefully listening to what God has to say and praying for obedience and praying for understanding. We never go wrong with that. It's how God works that out in our lives that's mysterious, absolutely mysterious. I don't know how he works it out or what the outcome necessarily will be, but I know that, uh, that it is never, never a bad thing to, to uh, uh, re meditate on the Word of God and and, exp and ask God for a greater and greater desire to do His will. Good, good evening. Yes. Um, I would like to ask a question, please. Yes, yes. Uh, again, Christian. Yeah. And uh, the Acts of Apostles, uh, chapter about the Pentecost, about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've been going to church and I've been seeing a lot of people possessing the Holy Spirit in them. And um, I don't know whether the Holy Spirit comes to them in various uh, uh, actions, because some of them will be falling down, jumping around, and I don't know. Well, excuse me, you know, uh, you said you see a lot of people with the Holy Spirit in mm -hmm. them. How do you know the Holy Spirit is in them? Yeah, I've been seeing them jumping around. Well, yes, but that, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is in them. What if it were uh, an evil spirit in them? You know, Christ, Satan comes as an angel of light. And why couldn't that, those be evil spirits in them if they're possessed of some kind of a spirit? Uh, the fact is... When we become saved, it has nothing to do with jumping around and falling over and all of that. That is not the gospel of the Bible. That's a different kind of a gospel. That is a gospel where they believe that their divine authority is not the Bible alone and in its entirety. They believe that it is the Bible plus uh, various visions or tongues or messages they've got through angel visitations or dreams and so on and so it's it's an entirely different kind of a gospel and there'll be no salvation there that is not the place where you want to be okay can i ask another question again yes well I, i've been praying and fasting and reading my bible and so how can i get it if i want it well, you can't get it because you want it. You have to wait upon the Lord. Uh, the, uh, so may I know whether those people who have it waited upon the Lord, right? Well, you see, first of all, the environment in which God saves is the reading the Bible, hearing the Bible. So you're doing that correctly. You're, you're reading the Bible. Secondly, you can be praying for God's mercy. You can... Uh, you can uh, know that God knows of your intense desire. 
But you, but you, uh, if God intends to save you, uh, he has to do the whole work of saving. You can't get yourself saved. And he will have his own timetable to save you. He may save you uh, tomorrow or in the next week or, or maybe not for several years. You just have to wait upon the Lord. And in the meanwhile, as you read the Bible, you learn more and more about uh, this uh, salvation plan. You learn more and more about God. You learn more and more about your sins and how grievous uh, your sins are and how you deserve eternal damnation for your sins. And yet you can, you also learn that God is a merciful God and, and, uh, uh, you can pray, Oh Lord, is it possible that I too might become saved sometime? How do I know whether I'm saved? <laughs> I'm sorry? How do I know whether I am saved? Well, that's a very good question. You see, when we truly become saved, We have become a new creature in Christ. That is, we receive a brand new resurrected soul in which there is an intense desire to do the will of God. And when you find that you are are only happy when you're doing it God's way and when you're ready to be obedient to whatever God instructs you in the Bible, you're going to get more and more assurance that can only be because God has saved me.